It's difficult to imagine any health issue which has commanded more attention in recent years than smoking and health. Professional journals, the popular press, and a wide variety of other media have focused intensively on a host of allegations concerning the use of tobacco by human beings. These reports have both informed and misinformed. They are long on questions, but short on answers. The outgrowths have included massive publicity campaigns conducted by government health agencies and private organizations attempting to change people's smoking habits. What are the contents of these charges? What is the basis for what is said and written? What is known versus what is only believed? Can we separate fact from fancy? Much of what makes up the so-called case against tobacco arises from statistical surveys. Samples of selected populations are measured with respect to the incidence of illness found among them. These studies compare, for example, rates of lung cancer or heart disease or emphysema as they occur among smokers and non-smokers in the samples. Comparisons then are charted and numerical correlations are reported. The question becomes what if any scientific significance should be attached to the correlations. Do these relationships between sets of numbers prove a causal connection or establish a cause and effect? By way of illustration, here's a graph. It gives a general idea of lung cancer mortality. I say general idea because this incidence line is subject to variation between men and women, among different races, and even among various geographic regions. But on the whole, Lung cancer as a cause of death is on the increase. This line that roughly parallels the lung cancer line plots the increasing use of cigarettes over time. You'll note, of course, that the two lines seem to track together, and in reality they do. However, that observed relationship actually asks more than it answers. It really poses the question of whether one is responsible for the other. And to this question, it must be answered insofar as the correlation between lung cancer and cigarette smoking are concerned. No one knows. It may, it may not. Statistics, you see, are not an end in themselves. They are an entry point for scientific research. When these relationships appear in the numbers, the task then becomes one for further investigation. Scientists isolate the elements which might play a role and test them in controlled experiments. The objective is to determine whether it's possible to reproduce the effect in animals, for instance. With smoking and health, these tests have been underway for decades. The result? Here is what one eminent scientist said, quote, No well-designed and well-conducted experiments have shown that cigarette smoke causes lung cancer in animals. Close quote. As to what is known in the field, another scientist stated, quote, all we do know is that recent evidence would point out that there are major sources of lung disease in occupational and air pollution exposures, close quote. As I'm sure you're aware, health alarms based on statistical studies are by no means limited to cigarettes. The list literally goes from A to Z, from aspirin to zoos. Two Chicago doctors implicated fresh air as a health hazard claiming it leads to insomnia and nightmares. Apricots have been questioned because of their cyanide component. Betel nut chewing was linked with intestinal cancer. Old books were cited as a source for a viral infection. Cats and dogs are on the list, as are milk, butter, eggs, cauliflower, peanut butter, potatoes, corn, peas, Brussels sprouts, and spinach. To name just a few foods, whose consumption has been linked with human disorders. Sex also is on the health hazards lineup, along with wax milk cartons and Worcestershire sauce. Beyond the statistical situation, there are some common sense questions one can address to those who make bold assertions about smoking and health. For example, how can cigarette smoking be the cause of lung cancer if the cause of lung cancer is, as yet, unknown? In fact, no one knows what causes lung cancer. Yes, there are many theories, and there is the statistical evidence implicating smoking that some insist is sufficient. 
Yet others believe that many factors are involved in the development of the disease, making it impossible to assign any one as the sole cause. A British physician has said, the cause of cancer of the lung is not known. We have only statistical inferences and forecasts. Until the cause is discovered, no one who values scientific evidence should assume that cigarettes cause cancer of the lung. Many of the health-related charges against tobacco are oversimplified. Now that may tempt one to reply in kind. But the tobacco industry prefers to deal with these issues in more than a superficial manner. It is committed to securing reliable and objective information to help answer the questions raised about its products. In addition to their own product research and development programs, the industry's support of independent scientific research certifies that commitment. Cigarette companies have made, and continue to make, substantial financial contributions to scientific exploration of the whole range of smoking and health issues. And many of the experiments underway today in laboratories, medical schools, and other research centers would not be possible but for the funding of tobacco manufacturers. For that reason alone, science includes those who have cautioned that if smoking were not available, some smokers might exhibit increased stress. Stress, of course, is cited in much of the scientific literature as a factor likely to be involved in human disease causation. For that reason alone, science includes those who have cautioned that if smoking were not available, some smokers might exhibit increased stress. I hope this brief review of a very complex subject at least helps to indicate that many open questions exist in the realm of smoking and health. There is not unanimity of opinion in the community of science on these issues. Some are convinced in one direction, others take an opposing view, and still others say that we have no business prejudging a scientific controversy. We need more information. This is the open-minded approach the tobacco industry follows and which it commends to others. Quality, in Philip Morris language, means employing not only 500 scientists in the United States, but also another 150 scientists and engineers here at Neuchâtel in Switzerland. Why the dual effort? Well, smokers in Europe have their own preferences. Local regulations call sometimes for different products and production methods. And even the international brands are manufactured in Europe too. For all these reasons, the science of a European cigarette must itself be European. If it was worth investing in a European tobacco research facility equaling that of any government, which indeed it does, it was only right to engage some of Europe's best and brainiest scientists to run it. Tobacco smoke is just one of many sources of substances in the atmosphere, most of which will be present without smoke. So when the Neuchâtel scientists measure any constituents added by smoking, in special chambers and in actual rooms, such as offices, they have to deal with minuscule readings, deeper still into parts per million, parts per billion, difficult to imagine, let alone to measure. For one part in a million, one ten thousandth of one percent, is five grams of grain out of a truckload of five tons. Or one part in a billion, one ten millionth of one percent, is five grams as against a thousand five-ton truckloads. So this is taking measurement to a phenomenal degree of sensitivity and precision. And that, along with its many other achievements, has reinforced the team's considerable standing in the scientific community. <laughs>